on behalf of Dr. Ibrahim uh, El Badawi, who, due to unforeseen circumstances, was unable uh, to join the opening panel. Uh, but he will try to join us later on uh, for the rest of the day. So, welcome to the ERF ARC PEP webinar on the impact of the war in Ukraine, food security, and compounding development challenges. So, the Russian Ukraine war has resulted in tragic loss of life, growing human misery, and massive destruction in Ukraine's infrastructure. The economic consequences, as the war remains unresolved, continue to unfold in a global economy already hit by COVID-19, climate change issues, with more serious consequences for developing countries. Apart from rising commodity prices, the war also triggered tight monetary policies across the largest world economies that raised interest rates along with the appreciation of the US dollar. As the crisis unfolds, the impact on African economies grows deeper. And in this context, the Economic Research Forum, the African Economic Research Consortium, and the Partnership for Economic Policy have joined forces to examine the macroeconomic channels, impacts, and potential responses to the Russian-Ukraine war, both in the short to medium run and in the long run uh, under alternative scenarios uh, to the so shock size and duration. And this work has been generously supported by the International Development Research Center, to whom we are extremely grateful. In the first phase of this collaboration, PEP and ARC's contribution focused on macroeconomic cross-cutting research, applying econometric techniques such as the CGE modeling and the JBAR modeling, while ERF focused on country case studies, paying special attention to the potential for building a set of regional corridors for food security in an integrated approach for four sets of countries. And these were uh, Egypt and Sudan, Morocco and Senegal, Kenya and Ethiopia, and uh, Mozambique and South Africa. The countries are selected based on their complementarity, comparative advantage, as well as geographical proximity. Also, most of these countries are uh, highly dependent on food fertilizer imports uh, from Russia and Ukraine, while most of them have high unexploited agriculture potential. Before I conclude, I would like to express our deep appreciation to IGRC for supporting this endeavor, as well as extending support to phase two, which will address the microeconomic aspects and distribution effects of the crisis. And we'll be giving you more uh, details on the way forward and phase two in the closing session. I also would like to thank the ARC and PEP teams for their partnership, as well as the ODI team for providing substantive input and feedback throughout the project life very generously. So thank you very much. And finally, I thank all the distinguished panelists and our research teams for their hard work. And with that, I give the floor to Dr. Wissam El Bey, Regional Representative for the Middle East and North Africa region for the IDRC, uh, to give the welcome remarks. So over to Dr. Wissam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin, and um, uh, good morning, everybody. Glad to see uh, such a round of uh, audience. It's my great pleasure to join this important event today. Uh, I am uh, um, new to IDRC. I'm the Regional Director for the Middle East and North Africa with Canada's uh, International Development Research Centre. And for those in the meeting who do not know enough about IDRC, we are part of the Government of Canada's International Development Programme, which focuses on supporting research for development. We support research in countries of the Global South to help address the most important development priorities. It was with this mandate that IDRC was able to provide support to several organizations during the pandemic. In 2021, we also initiated support to analyze the impact of the series of external shocks that countries across the globe have been impacted by, and low-income countries have been hit hard with what has become known as the poly crisis. This, these crises included COVID-19 and the subsequent slowdown in economic growth and trade, the growing public debt, several climate crises that we're seeing around the globe, and on top of that, the impact of the war in Ukraine, which is the topic of this webinar. As we will hear from the presenters, it is so important to understand how such shocks are impacting each country, and equally important how various groups within these countries are impacted differently. This includes the gendered impact of such shocks. I'm glad to learn that the current project is deepening the understanding of how, how women in particular are impacted. This evidence is critical to ensure evidence-based decision-making on countries' preparedness strategies for such shocks in the future, and on planning the needed support for vulnerable populations who are most affected 
and least capable of managing such shocks. IDRC is glad to have partnered with and supported the three organizations that carried out this important research and are hosting today's webinar, the African Economic Research Consortium, the Economic Research Forum, and the Partnership for Economic Policy. Our three outstanding organizations that have made tremendous contribution to economic policy analysis in Africa and in the Middle East. It has been great to see how the three organizations have also worked together complementing each other's strengths and also working with the ODI and Co-Water International. I want to congratulate the organizations on the work so far and their efforts to make sure the research is relevant and is shared with policymakers in our part of the world, as well as with global policymakers. We're very happy that the result of this work will also be presented during the annual meeting of the World Bank and the IMF next month in Marrakesh. I would like to thank all distinguished attendees who are taking part in this webinar and especially thank Global Affairs Canada for the ongoing support to research. Once again, a big thank you to uh, all three organizations for this important work and for sharing the result in today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wissam. Uh, Dr. Dominique. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to be attending this opening ceremony with all of you. Uh, thank you, Yasmin and Wesam, for what you have already said. Uh, if I can start with Wesam, as you said, IDRC has been the, the founding donor of AERC and then has been a consistent supporter of AERC and we are grateful to the support that you have provided, the guidance that you have given is beyond the money, but also to help us bridge the gap between research and policy. And then we hope to continue on that. To what Yasmin said uh, about the background of the project, I don't want to repeat it because that's really applicable and valid for, uh, for AERC as well. Uh, for those who don't know AERC very quickly, AERC is, was created to, to, on the assumption that good evidence generated by locally based researcher is essential for effective economic policy. Uh, as uh, Wesam said, uh, we are basically trying to reach out all, to all the constituency, including the, addressing the gender dimension and then uh, when we are discussing with food policy, that's definitely very relevant to that. Uh, one element that I want to stress is that uh, what AERC really would want to do is to take forward the partnership that has started with this project. Uh, whether ESRF, uh, because uh, AERC now is being asked to take its coverage to North Africa, and then we really want to partner with ESRF to make sure then that we have uh, an effective coverage of the entire African continent. And then uh, hopefully we'll be going forward with improved collaboration. Uh, PEP was also at the beginning, uh, those people who are behind PEP were also at the beginning, at the beginning of AERC. Uh, so we valued tremendously the effort that PEP has done in terms of taking the mobilization, the expansion of the policy framework uh, to, to create the space for the researcher. So we hope to be able to partner with PEP going forward to make sure then that we, we are more effective in uh, addressing the policy challenge facing Africa. Uh, on the AERC side, uh, we basically look forward to the second phase of the project because uh, the good results will be coming out of here. And then uh, something that we would be prioritizing is really uh, harnessing the, the results of this project to influence policy throughout Africa, starting with the discussion we'll be having at the margin of the World Bank and IF meeting, but also with very specific meetings that will be organized in Africa to make sure that the results of this project reach the, the, the relevant stakeholder and influence policy as it should be. With that, uh, I want to say thank you again for the collaboration, to, for the support, and then uh, I look forward for a discussion and hopefully we will then be able to harness 
the partnership that is emerging to make sure then that uh, we move forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Dominique. Thank you all for um, the welcome remarks. Um, we're now gonna be moving on to session one on the impact of the war in Ukraine on Africa. What does the global CGE analysis tell us? Um, we have with us um, the team from PEP, um, Dr. Caesar, Koro Rakan, Dr. Henrich Bowman, and Dr. Jessica Bowman. We're trying to reach out to see um, if, if they're able to join us. Um, I'm wondering if Dr. Martin can help us um, find their whereabouts. And the paper, the session is going to be moderated by Dr. Diana um, G. And forgive me if I haven't got the right pronunciation, Diana. Um, and um, also our lead commentator is Dr. Miriam Omolo. Um, and with that, I leave to, to Diana and um, uh, Yasmin, any updates from the PEP team? No, but Martin is with us. Perhaps he can let us know if he can uh, present on their behalf uh, or if he has news on whether they'll be joining or not. Because I know Henrich has email problems since yesterday. Can you promote Martin to panelists? So I am doing that, respond? but he's actually yes. declined. No, no, he is a panelist now. He has his hand raised, actually. Right. Martin? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, can you raise your voice a little bit? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. If you okay. can come closer to the mic, we'd be grateful. Yeah. Is it better now? Yes. Hello. Yeah, uh, I, I was in exchange with Heinrich before, so I don't know why he is not online. And uh, for Cesar, I also uh, don't know. He was, um, in my understanding, planned to, to give the presentation here. Um, so what I will do now, um, you want to have a presentation. Um, I can do a presentation based on our um, policy brief, which we um, shared with you. Is this okay? Yes, yes. Yep. And we've shared it with uh, Dr. Omolo, who's the discussant as well. So ah, okay, uh, okay. I'll give the floor back to Diana, who's waiting now, so okay. she can lead us. And thank you, Martin, for stepping in. Yeah, then I will just prepare myself on the computer, okay? Okay. So. All right. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you Martin for accepting to step in. Uh, probably I would do an introduction to Miriam and then I would kindly request you Martin uh, to ensure at least uh, you give a brief introduction of yourself uh, because we have a brief intro of your colleagues. So the commentator is Miriam Omolo. Uh, briefly, uh, she's the executive director of the African Policy Research Institute, where she manages research and policy communication. And she has also worked before joining the African Policy Research Institute. She has worked at the Institute of Economic Affairs as head of programs. This is based in Kenya, where she was also in charge of research and public policy advocacy issues relating to trade development and poverty reduction. Uh, Dr. Miriam has over 20 years experience in international trade and development. So I would say she's better placed even to discuss this paper, poverty and gender issues, as well as public finance management. She holds a doctorate in economics from the University of South Africa, where she examined the impact of uh, trade policy reforms on household welfare in Kenya using computable general equilibrium model. I don't believe this is what is mainly used here. And her main interests, uh, research interests are trade, development and poverty, public finance management, 
and the emerging extractive sector. Sector. She has experience in both macro and microeconometric modeling using survey data sets. And uh, lastly but not least, she's an adjunct lecturer at Strathmore University's Business School, where she lectures on managing decentralized funds and international trade and finance. And she also supervises a number of doctorate and master's students in the same subject area. So without further ado, I would want to give the floor to Martin to take us uh, from this point, Martin. You have 20 minutes and we have also, sorry, 30 minutes for your presentation. And we have 20 minutes for Miriam to discuss, and then we'll open the floor for 10 minutes. Kindly, I would request all participants to post questions on the chat, whereby we can engage. And we'll also have a few of us ask questions. And of course, the presenters will be in a position to answer if time does not allow us probably to engage one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much. Martin, the floor is yours. Um, can I uh, share Martin, my yes Martin, uh, can you please accept being a panelist so that you can share your screens Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, we can so, hear you. Okay, we super. can hear you and we can see you. So okay. <laughs> you can share your screen <laughs> no, and we're all set. <laughs> okay. Martin, we can it, see a black screen. Yeah, I have uh, computer issues at the moment. It's um, I don't know what's going on. Um, it's of course, not the timing now for for a reboot. I'm very sorry, but this is a. Uh, if you'd like, you can share. If you can send us your um, your presentation, and we can help you. Um, we can help you share it from our end. Uh, actually, it's not a. I would do it now from the uh, Word document because I did not prepare a PowerPoint slide. No? This is really a bit on and uh, present by this. Ah, but my computer is. Okay, do do we have that final word document that we can share for you? Yes, I shared it with um, patient, I pense. I, I uh -huh. yeah. Passant, can you I... share that, yeah, Passant, please? Yes, sure, one second. Okay, and I think then if you Martin, if you can stop sharing, thank you. Uh, but I hope... So I stopped sharing. Yes, percent is pulling it out. Yeah. As... Okay, yeah, super. Yeah, 
Okay, then, then I start. Uh, my name is Martin Henseler. I am working uh, for PEP uh, since 2015 as a, a resource person for MPIA, the Macro Micro um, uh, Policy Modeling Group. And um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm basically an economic uh, modeler and um, was partially involved in this first phase of the project uh, with uh, mainly with this policy brief and uh, i will be uh, involved in the second phase later um, so i will now uh, start the, the presentation by using this uh, document as we heard already the Russian-Ukrainian uh, war uh, created um, hard uh, trade disruptions by um, the world market, uh, on the world market for um, several commodities. In, could you please scroll a bit down that we see the graphs? So, stop, thank you very much. So, and um, we have uh, several impacts um, um, coming to, together here. Um, there are the sanctions against uh, trade uh, sanctions against uh, Russia directly and um, the um, blockade uh, against Ukraine on the Black uh, Sea um, channel. So um, we, we have um, problems on the world market because there are, if you could zoom a bit more in, that would be helpful. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the quality is a bit. So you see here just in figure uh, one that there are uh, essential um, trade uh, shares from these countries who are actively involved in the, in the war uh, and which are not supplying the markets anymore have in figure two shown an impact on the world prices on uh, energy, uh, um, uh, food and um, fertilizer and you see that there is a big peak at the end of the of the curve if you could scroll a bit down please and this stop thank you um, this uh, uh, price increases have impact on um, the African of the African continent and countries and we see here in this both figures three and a and B that uh, um, um, the regions um, of Eastern and Southern African, Western and Central and Northern African, they have different um, shares of fuel imports and of food imports, but which are all uh, relatively high, by nearly higher than uh, 10 um, percent. And therefore we can expect that there is a big increase uh, in economic impact by the increase of prices. And uh, we can expect that the increases are different um, based on the different um, economic structure and uh, trade uh, structure um, of these countries. If you could scroll please a bit down. So thank you. So and we used, um, also Cesar uh, used um, um, a world model, the PEP uh, 1T model, the dynamic version of a multi-country model to simulate the impacts of the trade bands and the price increase um, and to analyze the economic impacts on uh, different African countries. And we see that we have um, selected nine uh, African countries and the rest of Africa um, as focus of this analysis. Um, and we have here in figure uh, four the impact um, on uh, the uh, um, welfare um, accumulated over uh, five years um, in the, during the duration of the war. And we see that the welfare here is um, decreasing significantly uh, for the uh, uh, most for the uh, countries Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, South Africa. Um, 
which are uh, two of them will be so uh, uh, Egypt and Kenya will who are the most impacted will be uh, the focus of our analysis in the second phase. If we look at the figure five, it's um, still the same, thank you. It's um, the impact on the consumption of uh, agri-food products, where we see that the, um, um, uh, the uh, impacts are uh, very hard in Sudan, Kenya and Ethiopia, where the uh, consumption of food products uh, uh, reduces by nearly uh, 6% uh, from the baseline. This is uh, quite significant. It's also um, huge for other countries, but here in Ethiopia, Kenya and Sudan, we find a very big decrease. If you could please scroll a bit, our thank you. So um, in figure six, we see the impact on vegetables as one part. So we know um, this I did not display here that this consumption of cereals is uh, particularly influenced. But here we have the impact on the consumption of vegetable and fruit um, as uh, represented for the um, yeah, as an indicator for how uh, the quality of nutrition can be impacted as well. So we don't have only the impact on the cereals as um, caloric supply, but also on the uh, fruit and vegetables, which are important to have a balanced nutrition. So we have this negative impacts also in this, uh, mainly in these three countries, Sudan, Kenya and Ethiopia. And in figure seven, we display um, the uh, decrease in consumption of meat as uh, um, supply for protein, which is also um, uh, significant in these three countries. And also um, in Egypt, it's also high, especially for, for meat. Um, so then, now we have the impacts and uh, in this policy brief, we try to find uh, answers how, um, um, what are the challenges of the current policies. So um, one problem is uh, the, the uh, grain deal, which has uh, worked for uh, nearly a year um, quite good to um, um, reduce the price increase of food, but which has now been suspended. And um, can you scroll, please? And the second um, is that some countries are also involving export restrictions to protect their own markets. So this two yeah, the, the one more global policy of sanctions against Russia is, of course, something uh, which needs to be considered as a political uh, measure. So it's difficult to see it only with the, through the economic uh, lens here. Um, the same for the protection of the market. So therefore, if we want to uh, recommend policies based on our results, um, we can say that in general, releasing the, um, um, the boundaries for the international trade might help to um, the markets to recover and to find um, uh, back to a better equilibrium with less uh, price increase. So all the measures which could contribute to this um, could help to, uh, to, to reduce the severeness of the situation. Um, once is also to reduce the sanctions uh, against Russia for this particular commodities of uh, food and fertilizer, which is also asked. But here uh, we are careful with what, what we say because there are this political motivated um, uh, uh, rationals behind, which are beyond the scope of this policy brief. Um, the next point is um, for two is the stimulation of domestic production, which applies also for all um, uh, uh, shocks 
on on the supply side from climate change other wars or um, um, whatever happens to 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 the food markets if we strengthen the um, domestic production we build more resilience particular in the countries which are suffering and this is anyway um, um, an objective um, uh, already uh, focused on in, in development. Um, can you scroll a bit? The next uh, point is uh, regulating the uh, domestic um, supply um, that the countries might have the opportunity to um, steer um, to um, to uh, um, install uh, resources and uh, without um, uh, making too big barriers for the markets, not to install new bands, but if they have resources and then they, they can steer for what the cereals will be used for, so for the uh, human nutrition and not for animal feeds, this could help as well. And then last but not least, what is very essential, uh, 4.4 is protecting the vulnerable consumers, meaning the poor population and with uh, among them uh, women and children are the most impacted and uh, for women and children it applies also that the negative impacts on their nutrition which we expect will also have an impact in the long run for the economic growth. So. Um, that's why we will also focus in the second uh, phase of the project on the impact on women, uh, which are very yeah, close to children as they are taking care of the children and their nutrition. So the women are an, a, a key element, a key driver as, as a suffering actor and important for um, for the development in the countries. Um, and uh, then finally, as concluding remark, we are asking the questions, um, who can we ask to uh, act now? And uh, um, several authors see um, uh, the international um, organization in the responsibility and uh, um, sorting, Improving the situation requires um, the um, coordination, the international coordination between the actors uh, to find a more uh, stable world market and um, uh, especially to, to support the countries which have limited fiscal space to cope with this stress situation. Um, yeah, this is what I would. Uh, I would close here um, and um, again, I apologize for this ad hoc presentation. Um, I, I hope the message we want to communicate is more or less clear um, and I'm happy for looking forward for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Diana. Yeah. Before I give you the floor, can I just bring your attention that we've been joined also by uh, Dr. Henrich, who was able to join in. So, um, I, think, I think you, Sharin, I'm in touch with him. I thank you very much, Matt, I thank you very much, Martin. Uh, we are really grateful even for the presentation and for stepping in. Uh, uh, briefly, I would want to welcome Enric, I thank you for joining us. And uh, as you have agreed just to share a couple of words, I would want to give you the floor so that at least you can share a couple of words. We have like, um, it's 40, we have like uh, 13 minutes remaining. Presented. Welcome, Enric. Yeah. Diana, thank you so much. Uh, team, apologies. I suppose it was bound to happen at some time, uh, you know, the, with the time zones, etc. that there was a terrible mix-up with the starting time on my side. Uh, nonetheless, um, I'm here now, <laughs> and I've missed my 
my words of welcome that was assigned to me in the absence of our executive director, Jane Mariara. Um, so for myself, uh, as a research director at, at PEP, um, thank you all for joining us on this um, very important topic. Um, Martin, thank you for holding the fort here. Um, I think Cesar had a similar confusion as, as me with, with the starting time. Um, so uh, apologies, uh, as Martin said, for the slightly ad hoc nature of the presentation, but I think the, the message, uh, Martin, you did a good job of bringing those key messages through. And, and I just want to reiterate that, right? This work, um, and I think we've done a good job with that so far, is to not just see it as a tick box exercise of, okay, here's another project. Let's run some simulations. Let's do analysis. I think we've consistently tried to keep that policy message at the forefront of, of this research and what it means, because it really affects people's everyday lives, especially in Africa, which is so closely connected, as you can see with these models, with some of these supply chains and value chains and how it spills over into to price shocks in various markets. Um, I mean, I'm in the very bottom tip of, of South Africa, and, and we have felt certainly those effects in certain key commodities come through. So, um, Martin, uh, together with Cesar, has produced some, some excellent research. Martin will be taking it forward, as he said, in, in a more country-specific way, along with our colleagues at the ARC and the ERF. And, and I think some, some really more interesting work will then come out as we dig into these country-level specific aspects of it. So um, we're quite excited to see where the, the second phase of this goes. Um, and, um, and and like I say, I, I do want to reiterate that the importance of this work for, for real people in their real everyday lives and that we, we keep pushing this message forward to hopefully, hopefully do our little small part to help get this terrible war resolved as quickly as possible. You know, um, it's always it's always difficult when the when the politicians at the top, um, you know, fight for their egos and, and their state in, in the world and the poor people here suffer on the ground. So I think, you know, we need to keep pushing our messages forward just to, to clearly show uh, those general equilibrium effects, those regional effects, those commodity specific effects and um, keep up the good work. Thanks team. Back to you, Dana. I thank you very much, uh, Henrik, and thank you once again, Martin. Now I welcome Miriam. Uh, to okay. comment on the paper. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much. And uh, the team, uh, Enrich uh, and Martin, for the presentation, I got time to go through the paper. And one thing that just comes out even before we've, uh, I get into the discussions, which uh, Enrich has also talked about, when communicating CG model findings to any policymaker is one of the hardest things that you'll always find in any policy space. Because as a CG expert, you get very engrossed in the figures and the number crunching. And when it comes to communicating, it becomes very difficult to establish what do I put across, what will be understood. One of the strategies I've always I've learned to use when communicating is what do they want. Then from what I've studied or what I've done, I extract what the, the policymakers want, which is always not easy. It's easy when I'm looking at a paper that has been done by someone else, but when it's my turn, you also find communicating really is something. I would like to commend you and team for the good work you've done and for producing these reports. So I'm going to give uh, points in terms of discussions and also where there needs to be some clarity. So looking at this uh, policy brief, a very good one because uh, the Russian Ukrainian war has affected so many countries, particularly in Africa. And uh, key supply commodities has been, uh, has been discussed, have been affected, particularly fossil fuels, fertilizers and food commodities. This has resulted in increase in food prices, world food prices generally, and particularly the general or the global inflation we are seeing is being uh, triggered by that Russian-Ukraine war, among other factors, but this is a key factor. Uh, 
So as I was going through the presentation or the policy brief, one of the things that did not come out clearly was the uh, figure one and two. Those figures are not clear in terms of uh, the naming and what they entail. So that is something that you would want to really look into well as you try and communicate. Then my question is, who is the audience? Because this is a multi-country and a regional report. Who is your audience? Is it country specific? Or is it a regional paper that you want to take to the regional bodies, for example, because you've uh, lumped the countries as West and Central Africa? Does that mean you want to communicate with ECOWAS or with ECAS? When you're talking about South and uh, East, are you talking of COMESA or are you talking of SADC or are you talking of East African community or the specific countries? So you might need to really look in that as you are uh, communicating. Something that I know you've already done and you might want to include and also open for discussion. What are the key exports and import? Or what are the trading patterns that come out for the select countries that you have uh, done the analysis vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, Russia and Ukraine? Because the common exports you've put or the common imports for most African countries, you find that the fertilizers and the foods. But when you go to most of the European countries, you find gas is a main thing. So once you look at what is being traded, then the first round effects to these African countries are very important. Then the second round effects can come because of issues of gas in the European countries and what African countries import from there. And uh, we see that fuel declined a lot between uh, fuel imports. There was a decline if we look at those figures 2018 to 2020 with uh, West Africa, West and Central Africa looking like they are the greatest casualties if I compare the MENA region and also compare East uh, and Southern Africa. Uh, you might want to motivate, what are these factors that are making them such great casualties compared to the other regions? And this we can also open to the floor for discussion because the impacts are different, the interest therefore for such a communication would be very uh, different. Uh, when we come to the figures you presented, which are good, the share of imports of fuel and food against the world, uh, there's figure three and three B, is this share of imports against uh, world imports or share of imports within the African region? That was not coming out clearly so that you're able to establish really the impacts. The impacts are there, but perhaps a definition of that section very well. The season where the analysis was being done 2018 to 2020, we realized in 2019 also, there was the effect of the pandemic. I'm not sure how this was teased out when you're doing your analysis. This uh, should be coming out well so that uh, even as we are talking about the Ukraine war, where we know the imports of fertilizers, particularly and food commodities are very important. And even in terms of fertilizers, particularly for most African countries, it really constitutes, uh, fertilizers constitute a very big percentage of inputs. So even with that high percentage, if you want to also attract attention, look at fertilizer consumption for most of these countries, what they import and what percentage that entails and how that would actually increase their intermediate input costs, which then affects the total costs. And uh, this can really help in communicating why this research is very important. The simulation scenarios are good, and we've talked to simulation scenarios after three years and after five years. So three years to 2025 and five years to 2027, uh, which was the base year. And then there is also, so we see the first two years. Uh, it's not clear which are the first two years. And my expectation was either to see after three years or after five years. And then when you look at three years or two years, are we talking of short-term effects or medium-term effects? 
if you disaggregate that in that sense by short and long term, that would also be very helpful because of the adjustments you get in the markets. Then uh, uh, clearly again, increase in prices of fuel uh, increases inflation. And we have seen that purchasing power parity has actually gone down. And uh, looking at now the countries, particularly after the first two years, we realize that Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Egypt have been affected in terms of ranking, where Sudan is the first one, Ethiopia, Kenya. So the question is, um, is it because of uh, the political dynamics? If you look at Sudan and Ethiopia, is it the political dynamics? Is it the country dynamics? Or is it just production per se? Because some of these perform better such results could be also be motivated. And then loss in welfare is much higher in the first year than the second year. Uh, the explanation does not come out clearly, but now the question I would also pose to the floor and also for discussion, were there any mitigation measures or were these just adjustments that were taking place the way you put assumptions in your CG model then adjustments take place? Because someone could argue that, okay, the Ukrainian war is there, the percentages were high in 2018, and sorry, 2019, but they're actually reducing. But the storyline that needs to come out is that this war is not good. So what were some of the adjustments that showed that decline? But we still need to show the storyline that there is still a problem. Because you can be told that over time this will uh, reduce, or countries are also trying to become self reliant or sustainable. Um, most of the, the, pro, the commodities that have been shown are meats and vegetables. Uh, my question is why meats and vegetables? Because, and looking at Kenya as an example and other countries, when we talk about the main products, fertilizers, Fertilizers affect uh, most of our productions. For example, maize, which is a top crop in Kenya. You find this in uh, other countries. Uh, when you go to countries like uh, Egypt, you'll find wheat production and consumption is also very important. So imports and exports. And we know there's also a lot of imports coming from uh, Ukraine as well as Russia. How would these uh, play out? So the main top, the top products that are being consumed by these countries, what the important exports, just as an introduction would be very important. And are there strong substitutes for these products, especially those ones that can affect, uh, that are being uh, affected by this Russia-Ukraine war, because that also helps with uh, uh, policy prescriptions. Uh, from the discussions again, uh, this war, the sanctions that came uh, for because of the Russia-Ukraine war seem to be very counterproductive. And the lesson that we can ask ourselves, do export restrictions really work as part of sanctions? Because we are seeing it's becoming counterproductive. And as it is, Russia is still not budging much. So what can be done? One of the proposals has been to remove food from the sanctions or the restrictions, then that could also beat the logic of the restrictions to stop this war. Um, so one of the questions would removal of the Russia restriction, particularly intermediate products really improve production or improve uh, uh, consumption or the power uh, purchasing power parity so that uh, prices go down you'll find this is one of the key factors, but even if that was removed, and particularly for African countries, there are still supply side issues that really need to be dealt with. Uh, talking about the strategies, what are some of the strategies that can be used? I know when we go to from section 4.2 of the report, um, I mean, sorry, 4.1, We've talked about uh, improving resilience in food systems. So what are some of the strategies that can be used uh, backed by policy to increase self-sufficiency? Uh, uh, 
The key issue generally in the agricultural sector in many African countries is how to move from farm to fork in an efficient manner. The harvests are usually very good, but there's lack of information on markets. The markets are not well joined or well connected and there is no information. So storage also be becomes a problem. So post harvest, lo harvest losses are very big. So when we are discussing improving resilience, these are some of the issues we can ask and even open to the floor. And then the domestic food reserves or the domestic uh, reserves is a very important area. And if you look at the most of the African countries, that domestic reserves and uh, looking at Kenya also, you find that it also has a lot of politics so that it's managed in a way that uh, favors the ruling elites of the day. And where ruling elites is not just the ruling, uh, the, uh, the party in government, but even the, all the politicians. Uh, what are some of the ways that we can mitigate these uh, reserves, particularly so that it's used uh, to manage resilience better and not as a political tool for tokenism? Social protection has always been there. Uh, how can it be sustainable? Because what I've also seen is that social protection takes place largely in arid and semi-arid or very vulnerable communities where you use food safety nets and cash transfers. But when we are talking about resilience, you find that even the high producing farmers also tend to be affected. Uh, fertilizer subsidies has also been a strategy under social protection where you really domestic, you, you reduce the prices. But this has always uh, led to more rent seeking behavior. Uh, so the final question is we've given uh, the resilient strategies that can be used to cushion against this uh, Russian Ukrainian war. And my question would be, what is new that can be improved and is different from what we are already doing or what can be done better? Uh, with that, I hand over back to Diana. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, it is such a good discussion. And uh, thank you for the thought provoking you know, questions that you have uh, shared with us. Be before I, I, I bring our presenters just to react on some of the issues that you have raised, you know, uh, spanning all the from the restrictions to the strategies social protection, I, I would want uh, probably to ask the participants if there is any concern, please put it on the chat. Or if you want to ask a question, I can give probably uh, two or three people so that our presenters can handle this together. Do we have any question, please uh, can, our organizers assist us in checking whether we have anybody whose their hand is up. Any reaction even to what the commentator has said? As, as we wait uh, for the participants to react on that, probably I would want to, to invite Henrik, and Martin uh, to, to, to probably give comments on the views that have been raised. Thank you, Enric. Thank you, Diana. Miriam, thank you so much. I, I think a lot of those comments were on point, right? I think messaging is key with this type of work, right? And who's your audience and, and then articulating those results both in a way that is understandable, but also brings out the nuance of some of these results. You know, these are sometimes very complicated interactions. Um, and, and it's always a bit tricky in terms of, all right, you know, where's, where's the, where do you stop with the amount of detail and 
and in terms of that interpretation but th that's why we do exactly this right is to get a second pair of eyes on it and give us suggestions uh, and i think uh, most valuable for those inputs thank you very much uh, martin any specific feedback from your side um, no i would also like to thank miriam for this very uh, useful um and in and, and, and detailed uh, comments, I, I tr tried my best to take uh, notes. Um, <laughs> would it be possible to have a um, kind of written um, uh, uh, a document from on your notes or um, do you have them that, that would help then to consider in the, in the future in the further elaboration of the note? Because yes, it, it I was, sure. yeah. Well, no, I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I think we will um, improve the paper um, a lot based on, on this note. So, all right. Yes, I'll, I can share it in comments. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you, Miriam. That'll be great. Thanks. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much, Henrik and Martin. I would still want to, there's a question that has been posed here. Um, what are the top uh, three priority policy recommendations you'd have based on the results of the CGE. Probably you can handle that. And I would probably even throw this to the participants as we proceed. This being a final dissemination workshop, probably we can engage further and talk about the strategies that we think, you know, they, they are good to improve food resilience when you are talking about what has come forth, the social protection. I mean, what, what is this that we can do what is new to ensure that it is not uh, the consequences that come when we start with the social protection, uh, given that as, as Miriam has said that the high producing farmers are highly affected, would want to hear more. How can we handle this? So that at the end of the day, we ensure there's food resilience. We also want to hear from the floor, what is the new or what can be improved? What can be done better? based on what has come out of the paper, so that at least at the end of the day, we have much more information to even improve, improve on the paper. Um, we also have, apart from the three top recommendations, something else that is uh, being posted, very interesting presentation by PEP team, I just country uh, level details, um, I'm trying to lose this. This is from Doug, uh, from ODI. Uh, yes, it, it, it's a comment. It considers three main policy messages, promote international trade, produce domestic production, and protect vulnerable consumers. Should all countries focus on the same policy messages to the same extent, or do you think there are priority policy messages for different types of countries? Enric and Martin, you can handle these two questions as we bring this section to close. All right, I'll just give it perhaps a more general response first, and then Martin, who was more involved in the modeling, can can perhaps add some detail. It's of course very tricky, right? No one can really plan for a war uh, to break out in the way it has, right? And has, have those kind of repercussions. So, you know, it, it it brings this kind of debate on the table regarding, you know, the balance you have in in the general setup of your economy, where we're all right, where if certain countries um, are much better at doing something or have much better natural endowments at, at producing certain foods or whatever, that yes, you obviously trade with those countries, but in a sense, you can't put all your eggs in one basket, right? And, and I think the world is an unpredictable place. And, and to some extent, that is where local food and energy security and these type of things always come in is, is yes, you may want 
it may on paper look like it is it is best to perhaps import some of these goods and do so at large scale if you're not particularly good at doing it or you don't have the resources. But again, as one of those points Dirk already made is you got to diversify that that basket, right? Uh, it's not always possible with all goods, right? I mean, that's just the, the way the world is. But I think that is that is a key message that is coming out of this is is you you got to diversify that structure of your economy as as far as possible. Um, it gets costly, perhaps, the more you want to do it. But as these kind of shocks from from war show, is is that if you don't do it. You know, it, it, it's a matter of time before these type of shocks hit, whether it's climate related, whether it's war and politics and these kind of things. Uh, we can't put all our eggs in one basket, right? And 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 then I think it, it links to the broader concept that, that we see CG modeling getting more involved in, that is disaster preparedness, right? I think we need to have and use these tools preemptively, right? And And countries and policymakers around the world are very well aware of some of these global risks. You know, we, we see these reports come out on an annual basis. What are the big global risks? And, and countries and governments and policymakers around the world will be well advised to, to run a lot of these type of scenarios before, um, you know, before disaster strikes so that we can be better prepared in terms of what is a good mitigation strategy, who's going to be mo most exposed, who are those vulnerable populations, which form of support is the best and, and the most effective, right? So we, I think that to me is a message that, that comes out more and more, even from the, the COVID experience, right? Um, very few countries had a playbook in terms of, all right, how do we respond to these type of crises? And I think, you know, the, the, as economists and the tools at our disposal, we were very well positioned to to add to that, you know, and, and help build a playbook and and be, you know, at you know on the forefoot, you know, not not be reactive in oh, you know, what do we do now and what are these effects? So, of course, you know, I suspect that won't change quickly, and we'll have to do more and more of these exercises as different type of crises hit. Uh, but it does create an opportunity for us to push for better disaster preparedness, so that you know these these issues Derek already mentioned, you know. What's the best way to promote international trade and diversify our our structures to also uh, aid in security of key basics, energy, food, etc. Um, and and with with the protection of vulnerable consumers, that we have those playbooks ready to go um, and be much more efficient and quickly. Because you know, as I said before, you know, this is real real lives, real people we are dealing with, and. And a week or two in the life of a person at the, you know, at the bottom of the income distribution is is too long, um, you know. So that's why we we really need to emphasize the need to be able to to be ready and and not reactive as we tend to be, and policymakers tend to be. I think, in principle, you know, this is something we've been pushing in South Africa a lot more, also under the health banner. Uh, this disaster preparedness uh, and using these tools preemptively. Martin, uh, perhaps in a more, <laughs> sorry, I, I was now blabbering at a, perhaps at a higher level, if, if you wanted to to respond perhaps in a bit more detail to some of those points and questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Heinrich. Um, I, I would say um, but what we might need to, to, to keep in mind as well, um, what uh, we did here is an, an impact analysis um, of the of the shocks of the of the war, the impact of the war. What we used the CGE model for, which was already a, a big um, exercise to to model it in this way and to analyze this impact on the countries. Um, what we did not do with the CGE model was to um, this is also one question Miriam asked. We did not consider mitigation um, uh, measures. We simulated different scenarios, but we had just a look on the CGE results to see um, what, what happens, what do we expect, what happens. 
And uh, to answer the question, what would we recommend based on the CGE results would require to simulate the mitigation um, options, what uh, was also raised uh, by Miriam, um, if we uh, reduce the uh, shock by the sanctions, um, uh, if we uh, um, try to um, modify the, um, the trade, uh, the, the exports of the individual uh, um, countries. This, these are things we theoretically can as well do in order to, to do experiments, how can mitigation measures um, um, impact, uh, reduce the impacts. So for this, we would need basically a new modeling exercise. Um, to derive from these models, um, the policy recommendations in this policy brief, they are um, um, all based on what we found in the literature. So it is in line with what we see from the results, but we do not um, conclude directly from the results. We use the um, the support of, of uh, other studies to say, okay, our results show this and uh, um, other researchers, they recommend that the sanctions should be um, uh, uh, suspended for food and fertilizer. Um, so this is, um, yeah, this is why we uh, draw the policy conclusions also in a, yeah, relative uh, general way. Um, then uh, what I found also interesting um, to see that this global crisis arrives after uh, the, the other global crisis, the COVID crisis, where we um, see that the population who was already hit by the global shocks is hit again by increased prices. But um, also there are tools implemented, uh, they were implemented already uh, to fight the impacts um, um, of COVID, of the COVID crisis. And what did we learn from this crisis and this instruments, what which lesson can we take over maybe for the new crisis? What can we, yeah, what, what can we take over? Um, can the measures be extended? Um, of course, it's always a, a, a question of the fiscal space. And um, I think particularly with this type of instrument, this global CGE model, we can address mainly the global aspect of the global markets. So at the end of the day, it is a very multi-complex uh, um, a task to solve this problem. I think this is uh, one of my main conclusion, what I found for myself, it's uh, a big challenge. And then with what Heinrich mentioned, to go with this multi, um, uh, this is a very complex problems into the specific countries, um, this uh, requires has a lot of, of detailed research. Mm, yeah, thank you very much. That I would hand over again back to the moderator. I thank you very much. This is just one of the things that has been asked over. Uh, are the policy recommendations different from the earlier ones or other findings? And if they are not new, is the prioritization changing? briefly as we close the session. Um, yeah, if I can, again, just have a general go at that. Um, that's a good point, right? We haven't necessarily seen any groundbreakingly new uh, results come up as, as we've carried on and revising this study. Um, and again, I think the last part of that question probably lends itself to a separate piece of research to give a definitive answer to. Um, as, as Martin said, you know, how this study initially was designed, it was purely an impact study, right? We tried very hard and, and was very careful about 
inserting the shocks in a correct way and understanding the broader regional high level results, taking it to some sort of a country level uh, a little bit in you know, bigger countries. Um, and I think, and I think it, it, you know, I don't want to make a call on that yet. If if I've noticed prioritization changing, um, with, I, I would be speculating, <laughs> uh, which we could. Um, but I think, yeah, as Martin said, you know, I think as we now dig into the the country specific, and it's a pity we don't have the resources, you know, to to tackle twenty countries, you know, or whatever. So, uh, but for the ones we do, it'll be interesting to then take it to this next level and see, all right, what has been happening now that the, the war has dragged on for two years? Um, see if any of that has changed and a deep dive at a country level. But um, yeah, Martin, did you want to add anything to that? No, but honestly, I don't have anything to add. So mm. for me, yeah, so but uh, yeah, it, it's noted, uh, Arjan, I think that that is something we will push more into now that I think we, we're going to take more of a policy centered view of now that the call of the technical work has been done in a sense, I think we will be working harder to, to, you know, tackle all these very interesting policy aspects uh, about it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much and congratulations. And uh, we are really, really grateful. We have learned a few things and I want to believe going forward, we'll continue engaging in the discussions and even improving and trying to you know, close the gap. Uh, I want to hand over the floor back to Sharon. I thank you. Thank you, Diana. And thanks to um, Henrik, to Mart, and and to um, uh, Miriam for uh, a very well orchestrated discussion. Diana, you've done a fantastic job with uh, with the, all the initial hiccups uh, as we started the session. Uh, thank you all for a very for an excellent kickoff for our day. And I think now we're ready to move on to our next session on the impact of the war in Ukraine on food security, Kenya and Ethiopia and South Africa and Mozambique. And with that, I request um, Dr. Nicholas and Dr. Abebe to please accept being promoted to panelists. And uh, we have uh, Derek who would be helping us with the chairmanship and moderation of the session. And we also have our speakers, Almeya and Philippe, already online with us. So, Derek, the floor is yours. I'm not sure actually whether you can see uh, uh, me. I, I, I see a black screen, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll... we see a black screen as well. <laughs> okay. Um, let me, f I mean, I suppose first introduce just the speakers and then see what, during the speakers, perhaps. Uh, I'll, I'll can try and uh, uh, do something about my uh, my computer. Um, this um, uh, this session focuses a bit, a bit more on the country level and has a nice link to um, to I think the previous uh, session as well. Um, and um, uh, so the previous session already identified some uh, differences. Uh, of impact across countries. And uh, so countries that were mentioned like Egypt, uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, South Africa, and so on, were affected the most, for example, in terms of consumption. Um, and, uh, and I know that somewhere like 6%, so that seemed to be quite a big number. Um, and so um, it, it's good to also look into the, uh, the sort of the country uh, detail um, and, uh, and and thinking about what is happening at these uh, individual countries and uh, can we uh, get to a more granular level of uh, of impact? Um, and we uh, have two uh, sets of presentations, um, two presentations to sort of guide us uh, through the country level detail in this session, uh, which will last in total about an hour. Um, so we have first a. Uh, uh, a presentation on uh, Kenya and Ethiopia, an option for regional trade collaboration, and that will be presented by Almay Gheda and Philip Moshoka. 
And then we have a presentation by, um, uh, by Nicholas Ngapa on South Africa and Mozambique exploring the roles of uh, the Maputo Corridor, SADC and continental sources. Uh, each presenter uh, team will have uh, about 15 minutes to present. Uh, and then we have a commentator, uh, a baby shimanist. Uh, just to introduce the, um, the, the, the presenters, so Alamayu Gheda is a well-known professor of economics in international, uh, in international uh, economics in the Department of Economics in Addis Ababa University. He's also a research associate at the University of London, SOAS. Um, Philip Moshoka is an agricultural economist and has published books and papers on food security and has worked in, uh, with diverse teams in several countries, such as Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, and Ethiopia. And he's also consulted for a range of developed agencies, including the World Bank um, and, uh, and, and others, FAO and others. Um, and then for the Mozambique study, Nicholas Nagapa, uh, he holds a PhD in economics from the University of Cape Town and has uh, nearly 20 years of, uh, of experience in research and policy. Um, and he's also undertaken studies for, um, for organizations like the World Bank, uh, African Union, ODI, and ARC. Uh, and Abeba Shimles, um, uh, so uh, he's uh, at the moment Ministry of Finance. Um, he's also, uh, the bio said, he's a currently honorary professor at the University of Cape Town, Department of Economics. And of course, he has been linked to the ARC um, in, in, and, and other organizations, including the African Development Bank, in various roles. So we're very pleased to have. Um, to have you all uh, here, and um, and I'd like to sort of uh, maybe hand over first to the, um, the 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 team that is going to present the study on Ethiopia and uh, and and Kenya. Um, I don't know who's going to start first. Maybe Philip, are you going to start first? Or am I you? Uh, no, Philip. Philip will do it. I'll okay. I'll come back later. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So Philip, over over to you. You've got fifteen minutes. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me, all of you. Yes, sure. Ah, okay, great. And two, you can also see my my computer from where I am. Uh, you can see the presentation, I hope so. Can you all see my screen, please? I, I see you. I'm uh, not the uh, screen. Uh, and we can see the screen, uh, but you need to put it on the full screen mode. I, I have already from my side. Let me reshare it again. Hmm. Maybe I stop sharing, then I share again so that we I see whether it comes through. Share. And then I put it in full mode. Is it okay now? I can see it. I can see it. I can, uh, I can, see, I can see it too, Philip. Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. Um, I think it's clear that uh, Professor Willem has introduced us so that I'm not going to uh, take a minute that I'm, I'm sure that we have only 15 minutes and I want to really even take 10 because I'm also in another meeting. Uh, and I'll take you through uh, what we found out uh, in our study, the case of Ethiopia and Kenya in relation to the RUK, uh, uh, that is Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis in terms of food security. Uh, I have only selected a few things for those people might have been uh, or might be new to this presentation, but I'm not adding or we are not adding anything new that we found out. Uh, but mostly we want to know that uh, how Kenya and Ethiopia trade with uh, Russia or Ukraine. And we, we looked into the trade in terms of wheat, which is a basic or the most traded item between the, the countries. That is Kenya, Ethiopia versus uh, Russia and Ukraine. And we realize that there is only 34% that is accounted for as imports from Russia and Ukraine in total uh, into Kenya. But in Ethiopia, it's around 50. So quite a bit of uh, imports into Ethiopia, that is 50% of wheat. Uh, further, we also looked at food price inflation trends within the, uh, the period that we have experienced this crisis. And if you look at that graph on the on the right, uh, at around 2002, between January, February, and March. I'm uh, sorry, could... Philly. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the screen is not moving. The screen wow. is not 
is not shifting. So we call no. it yeah, now it is. No, oh, now it's yeah. so, so I, I present it in a non-presentation mode. I think so. Because uh, 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 let me try. Sorry. No, now it's uh, moving. Is it moving now? Yeah. So it's okay. So, so okay. So I'd gone through this 34% and 50% imports, especially through wheat. Um, and two, we I'd say that we had also looked at the price trends. Uh, we wanted to, to identify through trending where there are price spikes, uh, basically where we can pin down when the crisis started. Uh, but two, we also know that the crisis has subsided or maybe the effects because of the control of the movement of um of cereals within the, 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 the is it the Black Sea or where something? Uh, so the prices somehow trended downwards and almost went back to their pre uh, war uh, trends. Uh, we tried to map where we could get data with the domestic prices to see how the, the inflation uh, could be related to domestic uh, inflation, could be related to the global. Uh, price trends. That is, uh, I could get data in Kenya and actually monthly and I try to trend both uh, scenarios and see whether there was any uh, kind of a pull and push. Uh, we, we use simple models, uh, simulations to deal with the welfare and poverty element. And we just trended uh, the data uh, based on the, the, the domestic uh, household budget surveys. And we could uh, infuse or connect the two trends uh, through some of the formulas that are allowed within the welfare estimations. And we found some trends that uh, particular groups suffered more uh, than others. And we did this between the poor or maybe trending across income uh, quintiles and between urban male-headed or urban female-headed households, uh, whether they're in poor, are they in rural or urban areas? We wanted to see how particular households were affected. Uh, I'll give a summary of that. Uh, in Ethiopia, we did with the percentiles, and we found that there's quite some impact on, uh, around the 25th percentile, uh, where households lost quite a bit of welfare. Further, we looked into poverty trends uh, within, and this was available in Kenya because we have a household budget survey that we can trend households in a cross-sectional scale. And we could observe some differences in different uh, differences in terms of uh, the poverty impact uh, across the income groups that is from the poorest the highest uh, uh, the lowest uh, poor or the highest rich uh, group uh, uh, straight uh, from that uh, because also I just summaries it's quite a lot of uh, detail in the paper uh, our summary went to the levels of uh, summarizing the results and then concluding from them that uh, the dependence in Ethiopia and Kenya on Ukraine and Russia is basically tied to wheat and wheat products. Uh, so, so usually that is in terms of food, but I think somehow this is also the leading point of element of imports. Uh, so when politicians talk, um, I tend to look at them when they are attain or they complain about Russia Ukraine crisis in Kenya and are like, okay, we need to do more and understand the crisis. So in Kenya, we found that we had uh, the Russia and the Ukraine account for 9 and 25 percent wheat imports, respectively, while in Ethiopia it's around 50 percent. I'm really sorry, Philippe. I just want to make sure you're not missing out on your presentation material and relevance. We're still stuck on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it's there. Okay. Now, now we're on the policy dissemination slide so that we know what we're looking at. We're on slide number mm. 11 and it's jumped uh, from 6 to 11 onto the po policy dissemination slide. So then I, I'm sorry, I don't know then what is happening because when I put it in presentation more dear, then I think it does it move from your side. Uh, on my side, it moves. Maybe on some other people, it also moves. Uh, let, let me present it the way it is now. So, so uh, I've said that um, we have realized that around that 4% of wheat is imported from Russia and Ukraine, um, with Kenya importing around 25% from Russia, while Ethiopia imports around 50% uh, uh, of its wheat demand from Russia and Ukraine, with Ukraine accounting for that 8%. So you can see some slight imbalance there on the impact because 
uh, Russia did not really block its imports, uh, but uh, its exports. Uh, but then it was Ukraine that probably, if you import more from there, you're likely to have suffered more. Uh, we also know that the impact was transmitted through prices, that is import prices, what we call in our imported inflation. And the rate for every 1% increase uh, in wheat price, about 0.3 was transmitted to domestic prices. That is in every country. So if the price increases or the global price increase around 0.3, not one-on-one -on -one transmission um, will happen. So around 0.3% will be transmitted into the domestic shocks. Of course, it's because there are some barriers to trade and other elements that uh, like we still have some domestic production that can show up for the, for the lost imported quantity. Uh, which and which products are expenditure elastic because it's the demand elasticities, the price and income elasticities or expenditure elasticities that will determine the extent to which uh, the effect is going to be. Uh, we, again, uh, going through in, in terms of regions, Kenya and in terms of rural and urban. Uh, in Kenya, urban households are more affected than their uh, rural households. And actually, this is eroded uh, kind of the, the, the welfare between 0.4% and 0.6%. And this means that we have to compensate uh, these households. If we have to do social safety nets, we have to compensate them around 0.4% of their middle or their mean incomes, uh, mean expenditures. Uh, rural households suffered slightly less, but close to the same. We could have tested the significant differences or maybe this some stochastic difference kind of test to see whether the trends are significantly different, but in percentage, in absolute values, they are different. Uh, again, uh, if you are, you are in a household or the male head is a, is a woman, then uh, you're likely to have suffered more than the male head household. Obviously, this comes in, in terms with the, the ability to generate income within the household or to provide labor or to supply labor. So those female household headed, although it, it could be basically structural issues because long we've had uh, low levels of females uh, compared to male. And so goes with the opportunities to get incomes and uh, generate more income to, in case of shocks. Um, in terms of food poverty, uh, income, income class, which we, have uh, been supporting to drive the economy was disproportionately affected than the lower and upper income uh, uh, levels. So if our economy is being driven by the middle income class, you can be, uh, be sure that the, the Russia-Ukraine crisis had quite a dent on that class. But I don't think by the time we get updates from IMF or World Bank, it will be as very prospective at, as we expected. Uh, unless the prices and the shocks have been eroded, uh, the price increases uh, and the shocks that have been created have gone back to the normal. Uh, the instance gap, uh, I think these are obvious, uh, kind of remained fairly similar, uh, but there are marginal variations between the poor, uh, the gap that is offer you are between the middle line, the, the mean income and the lower level, and how severe that gap is, I think there are quite some marginal changes uh, in the two countries. Uh, we look at uh, that the effects could look insignificant, but they are still meaningful and they, they make us wake up to realize that uh, these effects, that exogenous factors can really affect our economy no matter how small or how far they come from, the, the ripple effects actually reached us. So uh, this actually the impact of uh, the levels of mean incomes uh, that are projected by the crisis. We recommended just a few elements, not all of, not everything, that because Kenya and Ethiopia depend on it in different ways, these countries can shove up their trade between the two countries, that is between Kenya and Ethiopia, uh, to mitigate the crisis. For example, uh, Ethiopia depends on dairy products that are in Kenya, and, and we could export more to Ethiopia if we invested in Kenya in terms of dairy production. But that will also go uh, if we develop the North Frontier Zone, that is the infrastructure in the Northern Kenya, which is a desert, 
uh, to join the Ethiopian islands of the southern part. Uh, again, uh, Ethiopia uh, or Kenya can benefit from Ethiopia through other cereals, which is uh, which Ethiopia is investing. I know they're investing much in wheat, rice, uh, uh, and even sometimes in maize. Uh, even though in Kenya we don't take teff, we can still start uh, building that uh, consumption of teff in Kenya. But to actualize these possibilities, there needs to be some kind of an organizational unit uh, that is going to put every sentiment together or every infra, uh, kind of proposal together. So we proposed uh, a joint working group between the two countries to address those potential bottlenecks that include trade logistics, trade facilitation, and maybe come up with a strategic engagement uh, a kind of framework that will allow a win-win situation for both countries. With that, I think we're going to beef up the, uh, the trade between the two countries, mitigate some of the shocks that come from uh, outside, that are, those are, uh, which are exogenous. And then we can um, maybe maintain the people at almost a Pareto optimality level that every household gets better uh, no matter the shock. So those are some of the proposals. I've had the proposal of safety nets, uh, that is sometimes we need to support these households with some kind of transfers uh, to build their resilience against the <clears throat> uh, food shocks. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, I'm doing a paper with the United Nations Women on resilience of household building and some of the, so, uh, the, the social safety nets are tending to be kind of negative in terms of building resilience. And uh, probably the reason is that uh, uh, when we support households in terms of cash transfers or in kind transfers, we create a form of dependency that these households continue in a spite of manner for them depending on, on aid or support, and they don't invest in building their resilience. Again, uh, most of the value chains, for example, which I invested on, uh, have negative profits. Over time, you, you may say that poultry may say that some particular serial value chains are going to be positive, but households are going to spend, because you are pushing them, or programmatically targeting the value chains, they also invest the time, uh, resources, uh, and many other elements like their land, capitals. And at the end of it, over time, you find that they either get negative profits or even very minimal profits that have no impact. So I, I think it's that high time we start looking at these social safety nets in the way we either structure them, or condition them to generate anything that makes or builds the resilience of our souls. That's just my off mark from the first presentation. Uh, we did recommend such here, but I hope uh, our recommendations are just direct from our results. Uh, thank you. I think I've not, I'm not going to proceed from the deck. Thank you, Philip. Um, you may want to unshare your, uh, your screen, but that's a very, very interesting presentation. Okay. I can unshare, right? If you can unshare, please, yes. Oh, okay. Um, that would be helpful. I think um, uh, I mean this presentation was already very, um, uh, very insightful, um, and the extent to which Kenya and Ethiopia are dependent on uh, on Russia and Ukraine, uh, and and also um, to different uh, um, uh, extents. But I mean, like a third of wheat imports depends on uh, Russia and Ukraine in the case of. Uh, of uh, Kenya and about 50% of wheat imports uh, in, so in Ethiopia come from Russia, Ukraine. That's a quite a lot. So that you can see that price changes will have a, a big, uh, big effect. And you also uh, went through the uh, the impacts at, um, at, at individual um, uh, household level as well. And then you had these two different policy suggestions, one uh, about um, sort of uh, dealing with the shock through um, a safety net and the other more or less dealing with shock in a structural way. Uh, it's almost like mitigating it, right? So just, just making sure that Ethiopia and Kenya trade more with each other so they can uh, deal with, with it in that way. Um, um, unless uh, Alamayu wants to add anything, maybe we can we can um, we can go to the the, the second presentation. Oh, Alamayu, Alamayu, you, you, you want to have you one? Just just one, a couple of minutes, two minutes. Sure. Okay. Uh, I just I just want to say uh, to give two context. Number one, uh, wouldn't uh, in both Kenya and Ethiopia, 
uh, you know, the share of the Ukraine, Russia and trade in the total import of the two countries is not significant. In, in Kenya is two to five percent of the Kenyan imports and in Ethiopia is three to seven percent of the total import. So the general context is what? So I just want uh, you to know that. The second point is that to do this, uh, because this is the policy brief, uh, we, we didn't go into the details, but to do that, we did uh, a lot of a lot of stuff, including uh, an inflation model for Kenya uh, and Ethiopia, uh, a welfare-based model uh, for Kenya because Kenya has a household survey, but Ethiopian household survey is almost uh, 2016, so not useless. Is useless, but we used uh, uh, income expenditure share and elasticities when it comes to Ethiopia. Uh, third point is that you know the indirect impact of uh, this war on both Ethiopia and Kenya is significant, uh, in particular for instance, the fertilizer price nearly quadrupled in, in Ethiopia, in Kenya also increased. Uh, the oil price is another indirect effect. The iron ore Ethiopia imports a lot from Ukraine is an indirect effect, but we haven't dealt with that because 90% of uh, the import of these two countries uh, is weight. So we focused on the weight. So I just want to put that uh, in context. Thank you very much, Derek. Very helpful, Amai. You should take, put it into context, um, right? And also pointing to the indirect effects as well. Um, really important. Excellent. Okay, I, I think we should uh, we should go to the um, to the next uh, presentation and then have the, the comments. Um, in the meantime, everyone, uh, I would encourage everyone to to, uh, to share their comments, views. Also in the in the in the Q and A box uh, or in, in any other way, um, so that uh, the presenters uh, can um, can also already prepare to, uh, their responses to the questions. Um, uh, over to you, um, uh, Nicholas. Thank you. Uh, everyone can hear me. Uh, yeah, we can hear you very well. All right. Um, I think my approach. Um, I take. Um, and an approach of uh, trade shocks as and its impact to um, on on food security, and uh, I disaggregated trade uh, by different sources of imports, and uh, I looked at uh, what happens when uh, trade from one source is shrinking versus trade from other sources. The idea here is to try and understand whether there are a possible alternative sources to um, food and nutrition security in uh, South Africa and Mozambique. And I think that when I was reflecting on the work, I was wondering if it's something that one should take at uh, um, sub-regional and continental level, because I think that it will give even more meaningful results at that level. But nevertheless, some uh, uh, significant uh, findings came up. Let me begin by uh, the graphs that are looking at um, the key uh, uh, elements that we're dealing with. Uh, first of all, um, the two countries that I'm dealing with, one is Mozambique, the other is South Africa. Mozambique's uh, food security index is quite high, uh, sitting at around above 40%, and it's uh, just there over the period 20. 17 to 2021. That of South Africa is relatively low, around uh, seven, moving from 6.9 to eight, increasing man marginally. But one thing about South Africa that uh, researchers have pointed to is that you don't really pick the issues of food security in South Africa at aggregate data level. It is at household level because of high inequality in South Africa. Uh, many aspects of uh, poverty and food security are masked and therefore you need to get them at household level. So there is a high level of food insecurity for uh, vulnerable households in South Africa that uh, one has to still take into account. And um, uh, when we look at the price series, we see that um, it's uh, trending upward, but we see significant structural breaks, particularly for Mozambique uh, during the 2015 to 2018 period. And then 
that break becomes significant uh, during times of COVID-19 and then going into the Russian-Ukraine war. And um, one cannot really make a, 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 a distinction between Russian-Ukraine war and uh, the effects of COVID-19 and other compounding shocks. On this basis, our approach is simply uh, that of uh, threat shocks and their impacts on food security, threat shocks from various sources. And one can then extrapolate if one way to be able to tell that by how much has Russian Ukraine war uh, deteriorated trade in food inputs and food resources, then uh, we would be able to calculate projections, um, estimations based on that. And uh, I'm going to skip to the, 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 the shares of uh, imports. Um, the, both countries are significantly exposed to global shocks. But when it comes to Russia and Ukraine war, we notice that the exposure is uh, quite minimal because uh, particularly when we are dealing with uh, food imports, um, it is really less than um, 2% in food imports for uh, both countries, which means that their, their direct exposure to the Russian Ukraine region is not very, very significant as we would have thought. But I want to caution that this work does not look at indirect effects because the Russian Ukraine war would take other indirect effects uh, through. Uh, intermediary countries before getting into these target countries, but we are looking at direct trade, effects of direct trade. However, the, 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 the results are still quite uh, prominent. And um, when we look at uh, imports of inputs, it's similar, but a little bit more significant, around seven, five to 7% seven uh, uh, of uh, exposure for both countries, uh, South Africa and Mozambique. And um, if we look at uh, fertilizer, this was fuel here. We look at fertilizer, exposure of fertilizer is similar, around five to uh, seven percent. And uh, if we calculate it by product groups, um, specific product groups, we also realize uh, that um, this column here is showing the share of um, uh, uh, exposure, and we realize that the highest is for cereals, which is around 2% uh, from Russia and Ukraine, uh, which then means that there are alternative sources. The question then remains as to um, if there are shocks as we are observing in the Ro uh, Russia-Ukraine region, what are the other sources that we need to encourage for development so that uh, shocks are mitigated? Uh, then. Um, uh, for that, uh, we look at a trade model where uh, it's a food security model in which we embed trade. Uh, um, food, the standard food security model depends on um, agricultural output, the conditions of demand of internal market conditions and external market conditions mm -hmm. and uh, economic conditions, uh, demographic conditions and economic conditions. So when we take, we, we, the approach that we took was that um, we disaggregated the agricultural production into uh, direct food imports, which would be food availability that is coming from outside versus food that is produced in the country. But when we take food that is produced in the country, we inputs are used. Those inputs are a combination of inputs that are imported from various sources and inputs that are manufactured from within the country. So if we make assumption then that this is how our model works, then we can develop a functional form to be estimated, which, uh, um, uh, uh, which will uh, have um, uh, uh, international trade in food and food inputs in the model. And that is how we develop the model. I'm not going to spend time again on the model because our emphasis here is on policy. We've presented this a number of times. So in terms of the results, the results of the, the questions. Nicholas, could I just quickly yes, please. check whether, whether you wanted to um, show different slides? We're still on one, one particular slide. Uh, are you, I think you, uh, on my side, the slide is moving. Then let me just take Not on my side, I think. So 
just wanted to make sure maybe take it out of presentation mode and then just uh, okay let me take it off presentation it. mode and and see what happens i don't know whether anybody else has exactly the same issue but i i'm just on the still on the motion big effects of fuel imports and effects of fertilizer okay. imports. Uh, I'm on the results here. Is it, can you now see on your side? I've taken it off presentation mode. I'm still. I don't know whether anybody else can confirm. Yeah, I'm. I'm the same, Dirk. I see what you see. Still effects of fuel imports. Okay, let me um, stop sharing and then share again, not in presentation mode, and see. Um. Can we see this um, uh, table of results here? Yeah? Yes. Okay, I hope this time it will move, but I will not put it in presentation. Yeah. The, the, the econometric results um, uh, for both, uh, two country, both countries and disaggregated uh, point to uh, the fact that um, the coefficients, which are elasticities because they are lock lock, is that um, uh, actually the direct exposure to Russia and Ukraine war, the coefficient of a trade from Russia, Ukraine is not the biggest. We, when it comes to food, we note that uh, the coefficient of food is not significant, which means that food trade is not the channel through which uh, um, food insecurity is propagated, but a food input tray, particularly a fuel and fertilizer. And when we look at the coefficients, the coefficients, we compare the coefficients of other sources, particularly the Maputo Corridor, the SADC, and the rest of Africa with uh, that of Russia, Ukraine, and we find that uh, the coefficients are significantly higher for Maputo Corridor, SADC, and uh, African sources. And um, when we go, the, the other exercise I decided to do was to look at the relationship between shocks in, uh, in, in, in Russia and Ukraine or trade from Russia and Ukraine war, the, the share of trade from that source and how it relates econometrically to other sources. A negative relationship would then mean that um, if there is a shock, it will be mitigated by these other sources. And indeed, that is what I found here, where I correlated that, and we find um, the strong negative relationship for Mat Maputo Corridor and SADC, uh, which then uh, suggests to us that um, these are indeed uh, alternatives for mitigation. So what is the finding? The summary of the finding is that um, in the model, the levels of income and demographics are the main drivers of food insecurity. More money leads to more dietary diversity, less supply volatility, but higher food prices. But higher, however, higher population growth results in more food insecurity. And that is according to theory, which then makes the, the, the model uh, believable. And uh, food imports from Russia, Ukraine region do not have any direct significant effect on food security in the two countries, according to these findings. The noticeable effects are propagated through imports of food production and transportation inputs with higher effects in Mozambique than in South Africa. So what it means is that Mozambique is more exposed uh, to uh, trade shocks than South Africa. However, both are exposed, but Mo Mozambique is more exposed. Uh, trade flows within the Maputo Corridor uh, and SADC and the rest of Africa have more effects on food security than uh, trade with Russia and Ukraine. And so any shocks from Russia, Ukraine area can be absorbed by enhancing trade linkages in the Maputo Corridor, SADC, and the rest of Africa. And we also found that a small economy like Mozambique stands to benefit more than uh, more from the establishment of Maputo Corridor and uh, continental uh, level integration than the larger economies like South Africa. What we are saying is that in terms of food security, uh, uh, the benefits of uh, uh, regional integration and continental integration is uh, very significant. 
and uh, that goes uh, in the light of um, the African continental free trade arrangement that we are talking about. So what do these findings mean then? Is that um, uh, uh, South Africa and Mozambique can develop and harness alternative, alternatives to dampen the effects of global shocks like that of Russia and Ukraine war on their food security. And precisely this can be done through the development uh, and facilitation of trade linkages within the Maputo corridor and effective trade integration in the SADC region and also the rest of Africa through the African continental free trade arrangement as one route. So there are key challenges that we have highlighted that is plaguing the, the importance of harnessing these channels in order to enhance food security and uh, uh, mitigate shocks, global shocks. One is that the trade imbalances between the two countries, and what I say here, one can also with reservation uh, extend to the rest of the region and the continent that when there are high trade imbalances, uh, some countries rely more on export of raw material like Mozambique and importing processed goods from South Africa. This limits its ability to invest in the agricultural sector and therefore leverage in order to be able to enhance food security. Uh, the background information that I presented uh, also shows that um, Mozambique's food production index is very high, but very volatile as well. And so higher investment to stabilize this production index is very important uh, to be able to, to leverage uh, food trade. And um, political instability and conflicts are also very prominent in the region, both within and, 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 and uh, across. We know of uh, the Cabo de Garda situation, and all of these pose a uh, significant uh, risk to trade. And this has effects on food security because it dampens or uh, blocks the, 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 the attenuating effects of alternative trade routes that uh, we have. There are infrastructure limitations. We know that uh, some key investments have been happening. The, the Maputo corridor, there's a, a quite strong infrastructure network being developed. But when we look at this in the context of the region in general, and also in the context of the continent, I think that um, one of the biggest call is cross-border infrastructure. Uh, for uh, for uh, effective trade in order to mitigate food security uh, that will have been posed by global shocks. There's limited access to credit facilities affecting smallholder farmers in both countries, which prevent them from investing in their farms and increasing productivity. There is also inefficient uh, resources, uh, inefficient use of resources, low capacity and slow and bureaucratic implementation of processes, which hamper movement of goods and services, and these inefficiencies should be addressed. So the areas of policy focus is diversification of import sources and preference for imports from regional and continental blocks. And the focus on uh, inputs to food production rather than food import. And I think that um, the, the, this is a very important finding that um, attention to be focused on production, food production, and opening up to trading in inputs to food production uh, based on the fact that food imports do not really have significant effects. Food import shocks do not have significant effects on uh, food security. It is uh, a shocks in uh, the trading in inputs to food production. Diversify ag the agricultural sector by investing in high value crops to reduce the trade imbalances and increase exports um, and improving especially cross-border transportation infrastructure, such as roads and railways to facilitate the movement of agricultural products and stimulate trade and investment. And to collaboratively, uh, collaboratively promote local and foreign investment by enhancing uh, governance and security uh, yeah. across the region and increasing access to credit facilities for smallholder farmers, especially marginalized groups is crucial for investment and productive productivity growth. Enhancing efficiencies and streamlining the implementation process along the Maputo corridor by 
uh, simplifying procedures and improving coordination and training, amongst others. Then addressing poverty and inequality through targeted initiatives to in ensure equal access to resources and contribute to food security. And uh, broadly, this is the policy message that this work carries. And if there is something that should be done further, what should we do further uh, to this research is that um, we need to carry this analysis to a micro level, household level, to be able to see the linkages to household, especially vulnerable groups, particularly by gender, by age groups, and this is doable, especially for South Africa, where we have rich um, survey data that can be mapped to, to products that are traded, goods and services that are traded, so that one is able to look at uh, food insecurity from the household level by various vulnerable categories uh, based on uh, this same approach. And secondly, um, uh, my thought is that um, the policy dissemination should go wider to be able to, not wider per se, but more focus on the two countries, if it were possible, which I proposed the last time we had the other the policy, the first policy works, uh, meeting, is that um, it might be important to have a, a, a regional level kind of policy dissemination workshop where key stakeholders see the importance of uh, uh, facilitating regional integration. So I'm going to then stop here and uh, allow for comments. And I hope that this was... Uh, Excellent. Excellent. Thanks very much, Nicholas, for this excellent uh, presentation, highlighting a few very important things. I think, I mean, you mentioned that the direct exposure wasn't perhaps too, um, too big to, to Russia and Ukraine, but it differs between Mozambique and South Africa. Um, but also that this is not a, a story of just averages that you actually need to look into the details and there's uh, there are large inequalities both in of course uh, particularly South Africa but also Mozambique and that there can be uh, impacts on food insecurity or on food security um, despite low uh, low average effects um, but also um, I think there's a very nice link uh, to the previous presentation which is around the opportunities that regional trade brings um, perhaps you, uh, with, with the neighbors um, in, in um, in the Maputo corridor, for example, uh, as we've also seen in the, sort of the Kenya Ethiopia presentation. And these are, of course, policies that perhaps countries should be doing anyway, but they can intensify them and prioritize them, um, and these structural policies uh, in, in times of, uh, of shocks. Uh, now, we've got uh, uh, one very distinguished uh, uh, commentator, and I hope, uh, Abeba, that you are um, uh, online um, for your uh, comments. Uh, maybe you could. Um, have about ten to fifteen minutes uh, for your for your comments. So there's there's still also a chance to um, um, to um, um, uh, for for the for the audience to have uh, questions uh, and the presenters could answer. But Abeba, over to you. Thanks, Doug. Uh, good to see. Well, good to hear from you. Uh, I don't think I can see you. Um, no, my apologies. I, I think it says the, the, the host has stopped sharing my video. I don't know what, but I, don't, I, will, I will probably log in after this session and then you can see me. I've got a second go later on. Apologies for that. No, no, that's, uh, that's great. I think these are very, very uh, informative uh, and well uh, done uh, uh, policy briefs, I assume. Um, the uh, uh, full papers uh, have been discussed uh, in another uh, platform. Uh, so I would not really focus on uh, methodologies or uh, other specific uh, results from the analysis, rather uh, more on uh, framing the, the uh, challenge African countries, including Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, uh, Mozambique, and South Africa have been facing as a result of this uh, unexpected uh, shock coming from the war uh, in Ukraine uh, with Russia. Um, I think uh, I, I would uh, start with what Alamayo said uh, in putting this in context. Uh, I'm sure uh, this is a very complex process that has happened uh, in the past year. 
so difficult to track uh, clearly the impacts uh, because of, uh, I think, two, two factors. One, um, the relationships uh, countries like uh, the, the ones covered in this study uh, and Russia and Ukraine have uh, in terms of trade investment uh, and other other uh, economic relationships uh, are not easy to pick up in uh, any kind of statistical or model analysis, as we all know. Uh, so there is a direct uh, and indirect impact that countries experience uh, because of the conflict. One, for instance, when it comes to uh, direct impact, uh, which I think both uh, policy briefs picked up, is the uh, uh, exposure these countries have to uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine through imports of uh, uh, some of the strategic commodities like wheat, uh, edible oil, uh, fertilizers, uh, iron also, fuel. Uh, so all combined, uh, this uh, uh, provide a basis to evaluate the impacts. But there is also the indirect impact, which Alamayo alluded to. One is the war, uh, as we all know, has rattled the world economy, and the big players uh, also uh, in, in that space. As a result, uh, you can see um, some of uh, the prices, uh, world prices for uh, uh, fuel uh, um, and, and other commodities uh, have increased uh, because of that. But also, I think, uh, um, especially Europe, which is uh, Western Europe, which has uh, uh, faced also some value chain disruptions, energy crisis, etc., uh, its, uh, its economy has slowed down, which also led to uh, a rise in interest rates. Uh, similarly, I think parallel to what uh, what was happening in the war, uh, the U.S. also increased its interest rates, uh, so which led to uh, a stronger dollar. So when you combine all of this, uh, it's uh, difficult to track uh, the impacts on the countries. Uh, in that regard, then you know the papers have done an excellent work to try. Uh, to see the magnitude, even with those uh, factors that we are able to uh, make a connection between household welfare and the uh, uh, ripple effects uh, coming from the war uh, in this uh, uh, between the two countries. So I think uh, one can benefit a lot from the insights uh, presented in, uh, uh, in the uh, briefs. Uh, so uh, my comments uh, on the Ethiopian and Kenyan paper, I think uh, it's a well-written brief. I was uh, uh, able to uh, clearly see uh, how it played out uh, in both countries. Um, and I am uh, happy, I think, uh, how they framed the channel in which uh, uh, the uh, changes in relative prices uh, could uh, impact uh, vulnerable households. They quantified it and gave us some order of magnitude. Um, uh, probably, I think what I can uh, add in this is, uh, which applies for both papers, uh, is that uh, uh, the there is some. Uh, I think some some sort of work uh, also by the IMF, uh, which they reported in the World Economic Outlook, um, uh, from where we could glimpse, uh, it may not be precise, uh, the impacts uh, uh, of the likely impacts of the uh, uh, russia ukraine war on, on uh, some uh, African countries by looking at the variance in the forecasts they have made before and after the war. Um, so that gives you, uh, for instance, just to give you an example, uh, inflation uh, in nearly all the countries covered, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Mozambique, South Africa, uh, the variance in the forecast that IMF made prior to the uh, uh, onset of the war and after uh, show you some 
uh, order of magnitude uh, to pick up uh, to to just uh, uh, gauge the the magnitude of the impact. So that would be um, a place uh, for uh, for them to see and even validate uh, their own analysis. Uh, they did the same thing for real GDP growth, etc. Um, and it's a uh, uh, it's a good way of uh, framing uh, their uh, analysis without changing it. But they could also reinforce the arguments they have provided in the papers. So, um, in terms of, uh, I think uh, the rest of my comment uh, for both papers focused really on uh, okay, then what? I mean, what are the policy implications or considerations we can uh, pick from the analysis. Uh, I think both papers focused on uh, uh, more on uh, uh, reforming the structural uh, aspects of trade, for instance. Um, for Ethiopia, for instance, the recommendation highlights the benefit of uh, Ethiopia and Kenya collaborating uh, in promoting uh, intra-Africa trade or uh, between country trades on wheat and other uh, similar products uh, coming from Kenya, going, uh, from Ethiopia, uh, improving the infrastructure that links the two economies, etc. I think these are very good uh, ideas that help uh, diversify risk and mitigate potential impacts uh, of uh, global nature that come well, well beyond the uh, borders of these countries and probably away from even the continent. So this is, I would even, you know, uh, uh, suggest because it's also there in the paper uh, by Nicholas uh, for South Africa and Mozambique. I think the intra, uh, this uh, after or what, uh, whatever uh, now we are doing in the continent to deepen integration is I think an important vehicle uh, for the whole of Africa to manage uh, risks emerging uh, outside of the continent uh, or risks of these types. So I think this is uh, a legitimate and uh, 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 something that follows from their analysis. But then I didn't see much uh, in terms of uh, the physical impacts of this uh, war on uh, government budgets, because that's where I think uh, the most immediate uh, um, uh, challenge comes for the governments to overcome the impacts and manage the impacts, but also build resilience as they go forward. Um, there are some, I think, in my view, uh, um, the efforts to stabilize prices by governments uh, and also protect uh, vulnerable groups uh, from uh, uh, the potential income loss that, that uh, uh, was created by this uh, uh, event, etc. Uh, so it would even take us uh, beyond um, the domestic uh, fiscal policies, but also the global financial architecture. As we all know, uh, the war in Ukraine precipitated the debt burden in many African countries. Um, a lot of them uh, had to uh, deal with this situation um, by uh, increasing borrowing, but also spending uh, most of their resources on debt service. So uh, the topical, I think, uh, policy uh, consideration at this uh, point in time for many African countries is how to build their uh, the buffers uh, whenever they are faced with uh, uh, shocks that are beyond their control. Uh, so I believe uh, the policy implications uh, would also uh, include uh, reforms uh, on the fiscal side. That means the governments need really good uh, reforms uh, to ensure they uh, always put buffers uh, uh, to be used in cases like this. Uh, that's, a, I think, a very important one. Uh, so that takes them into uh, robust domestic resource mobilization efforts uh, during uh, good times. Uh, and also important consideration is uh, efficiency in expenditure, but also enhancing social protection programs uh, to protect employment, to protect uh, uh, households from falling into 
uh, extreme poverty. So they have been touched in the case of South Africa and Mozambique. Uh, I think they can be beefed up uh, and further uh, enriched in the Ethiopia and uh, Kenya uh, paper. Uh, so finally, I think um, the uh, uh, it's good um, uh, to indicate, at least even in the policy briefs, um, a little bit about the methodology. I mean, for a person like me who just read it, uh, had no clue where the results came from. So it would be, I think, appropriate to have one paragraph. Uh, what uh, sort of uh, approach was used to get to these results uh, and indicate uh, some of the limitations, uh, which are obvious uh, in any effort that uh, we make when we try to track uh, impacts of such a complex measure uh, on another complex uh, factor, such as household welfare, food security. Uh, for the Ethiopia and Kenya case, and, and probably it might work again for Mozambique and uh, uh, South Africa, I think uh, whenever we have this kind of uh, significant shocks, uh, I, the impacts are felt more on vulnerable groups, um, especially in uh, very low income situations such as Ethiopia. Um, children, uh, especially infants, uh, tend to suffer a lot um, in inhibiting their early groups. I think this is something uh, evidenced by empirical research. So it's good to uh, highlight this uh, uh, so that in the policy consideration, uh, protecting infant nutrition uh, in times of such hardships also are uh, very important if we uh, really want to uh, save the future generation uh, through the uh, early childhood uh, uh, developmental impacts. So thank you, Dirk. I think uh, these are two yep. very exciting papers. Yeah. Thank you very much, Abebe, for the really, um, really excellent uh, comments, um, highlighting a range of issues, and also your last point that impact uh, is greater on vulnerable groupings, and I think that's also evident uh, from the from the papers, right? And uh, uh, that also the Kenya, uh, Ethiopia paper, the um, the impact on women for uh, or female headed households is 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 bigger than in others. Um, the um, the other issues I think you um, you you highlight is about the indirect effects, which which of course is very difficult to model, but they're there, right? So the deep platicals, the slowdown in growth, the, the interest rate changes, and so on, and the in, the importance for African countries also to be able to prepare for shocks that emanate outside African countries. Um, and I think that brings us back also perhaps to the question that that that, that I think Ion raised in the chat in the previous session is basically, and maybe that's also something that I would like to put also to the to the um, to the authors is basically what 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 is new, um, what are policy implications are new, or are they uh, already uh, something that we knew and they just need to be intensified? And so we have um, uh, uh, on the one hand. Um, increasing the number of shocks facing uh, uh, African countries, both uh, internal, of course, uh, already um, and, and large shocks, but also global shocks. And so if there should there be more emphasis on dealing with shocks uh, in, in, in that way, uh, protecting vulnerable groupings, um, um, or, is, uh, uh, and, and, or is there um, something new to be done on the structural side? So should there be more emphasis on um, uh, on 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 the trade side, um, and sh sh do we have to balance right? So should we be focusing more on the structural side now, more on the uh, on the on the protecting the vulnerable groups, or both? Should we do both? Um, uh, and I don't know whether um, uh, so. There's we have about five minutes to sort of um, uh, finalize the session, uh, and I don't know whether there's anybody who'd like to make a comment or a question. You can do so in the question and answer um, a box. Uh, so you can make a comment there. Otherwise, I'd like to sort of ask um, Alamayu and, um, uh, 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 and, and maybe Nicholas as well to sort of maybe just reflect a bit on Abeba's comments uh, as well. And uh, I mean, what is new? What what do you say? What is really new now? So uh, what's what, where should be should should the, the the balance of emphasis shift 
on certain policies or um, should we be doing things that, that we should be doing anyway um, and just focus on implementation? What, what, what is new? Uh, uh, Eric, uh, can I go, Derek? Sure, sure. Uh, good. Um, uh, I, I just want to thank uh, Abebe for the excellent uh, comment he gave us. Uh, I have nothing to add actually. So very good. Uh, I think we'll do we will do some of the nice uh, comments that he gave us, in particular contextualizing it, mention a little bit about the method in the in the in the policy brief. And uh, we recognize also, you know, the, the limitation of that, and we have to put it in the policy brief. We'll do that. Uh, good. Thank you very much. I, I would say, <clears throat> Derek. Yeah. Okay. That's 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 fun. that's fantastic. And, and 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 anything on sort of balance of policies. So is there anything? So I mean, you you mentioned both on so protecting vulnerable groupings um, and also. Uh, starting this group uh, to look at the Ethiopia-Kenya border. Um, I mean, is there a, uh, is there anything where there needs to be a, a shift in the balance uh, of, of approach? I mean, should there be even more emphasis on, on protecting vulnerable groupings? What, what, what would you say on the basis of the uh, paper? Uh, I, I would say that, you know, uh, as you know, uh, we have a lot of shocks. Conflict is a major shock. And in that part of uh, the region, you know, some of the limitation for the, our recommendation is unless you you somehow resolve the conflict uh, across across the board, it will be difficult to have even a safe a safe corridor for trading uh, and facilitating trade. So it, it appears that trade uh, should be you know uh, understood in not only on the in the context of CFTA. But in the context of regional infrastructure, regional and peace security, then we can come to the, the kind of issue that you mentioned, like targeting and address structural uh, issues. Like, for instance, in the, we didn't mention it here. Uh, we found that food insecurity is huge across the region, in particular in Kenya and Ethiopia. I think the, the shortfall is about 30%, 30 to 50%. Uh, in both countries. So comprehensively addressing that jointly will be addressing the structural issue for food security. So trade will be just a contributor to that process and targeting vulnerable groups will also a contributor to that process. So the overarching should be addressing the structural food security issue and vulnerability to external shocks. But within that, then we can go to the targeting uh, I guess, Derek. Yeah. Nicholas, uh, any any uh, any comments from 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 you uh, on the excellent comments by uh, by Beda? What is new uh, is that um, is something that is has always been there that um, we have alternatives to develop and enhance that will be helpful, and that if that those alternatives are properly catered for then uh, uh, most African countries would be less vulnerable to shocks. And these alternatives are the regional sources, like the Maputo Corridor, the SADC, and uh, the African Continental Free Trade Area, which I think there we uh, work really. We didn't do it consulting each other, but the finding there seems to be saying the same thing. The second thing, what is new is that um, this research suggests that um, the attention should be focused on factors, trade uh, emphasis on trade in factors that go into food production as opposed to food trade, food import and food export. What it what it suggests is that there is capacity to meet local food demands through local food production, but what is limiting is the capacity to produce and therefore. Uh, uh, trade should focus on inputs to production as opposed to final goods when it comes to food import. And that I think these are the two areas that I wish to emphasize. But I also wish to say that um, the scope of this work was quite broad. One had to do a very fine balancing act to see where do we focus. And uh, I have I've heard that there might be a second stage 
And that is why I talked about more emphasis, emphasis more focused analysis on these vulnerable groups by age groups, by gender. I know that uh, my colleagues from uh, the Horn of Africa have touched on uh, a certain analysis linking to vulnerable groups, but we can see that much is needed. We really need to zoom on them before we'll be able to say much about that, about uh, what kind of policies one can put in place in protecting the vulnerable groups specifically. And finally, in relation to whether we should have a choice of a trade versus protecting vulnerable groups, my suggestion is that both have to go hand in hand. I think in the short run, you need a safety nets for vulnerable groups to cushion them from shocks. But uh, for a more sustainable approach, we need to have an approach that uh, leads us to more food self-sufficiency across the board, which has to be addressed uh, partly and more importantly by trade, cross-border trade, regional trade, trade with pro uh, countries that are in proximity, which, uh, which where um, the more, more vulnerable, the poor can easily participate. And that is the nature of cross-border trade. I think that is what I would say for now. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Both are uh, very good points, uh, uh, Nicholas. And uh, um, so not only thinking about food, food trade as such in terms of finished products, but also inputs. And I frequently make that point, uh, for example, I see in the UK at the moment, also the importance of having import policies uh, in order to export because about 15% of what the UK exports is imported. And uh, um, and 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 what you make, you, you make the point slightly differently about the importance of inputs into the production process, which is really important. And I think the other point uh, which both papers focus on is about regional trade. And I think there, um, it, it isn't maybe necessarily just uh, sort of uh, the trade diversion debate that you are both emphasizing, but I think it's 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 more like the no regret policy uh, uh, attention to regional trade, which is that making regional trade more uh, efficient and just reducing trade barriers uh, and trade and the cost of trade regionally, because actually the cost of trade regionally is is higher often, and it takes longer to trade within Africa and then than with the rest of the world, and and so that needs to be done anyway, where whether or not prices are going up or down, uh, because of course prices can go down, and then you may have the other the a different type of argument uh, for for trade trade diversion, trade recreation. But I think the you know, making trade more efficient and reducing trade costs will apply with the price of going up and down. So I think that's a very powerful message. And also your point around um, protecting vulnerable groupings, uh, which is well taken. And even if you are um, um, promoting regional trade, then there, is, there are always some winners and losers, although the, the, the losers can, can be compensated and can be, can be addressed in a, in, a, in a managed way. So I think that is a, these are very important messages. And maybe I'll sort of stop here because we're at the end of the, the, the session. So thank you very much uh, to the presenters and also to the commentator and for coming back. And uh, thank you to the audience as well. I think we're going to take a break, but let, let me get back to the organizers, the ERF, um, uh, maybe Yasmin or uh, Shireen, um, and then I'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, we have, uh, well, uh, we have a 10 minute break according to the schedule, uh, after which we would be moving on to the country case studies. So um, I would request we do have that 10 minutes and we convene at 13.35 Cairo time. Thanks to all.